there you go. It says recording in progress. So I will be admitting some people. I'm going to put my contact information here into the chat window. If any of you have any questions after the fact, you may write me or call me. I don't mind. I have my computer plugged in and we should be good to go. I'm just, it says it has a full battery, but I'm getting paranoid, so I'm gonna plug it in anyway. All right, let's get started. Okay, where am I? Share screen. We're going here. From current slide, from beginning, yes. Okay, so I will be still admitting folks as we go. So there will be some tiny interruptions here and there, but I will be admitting folks. So hello and good evening and happy Thursday. I hope you are all staying cool. We are continuing our jog through Denver through the decades. We are currently up to the 1930s. This year is going fast, my goodness. So here we are already at the 1930s. A reminder, all of the presentations that we've done prior have been recorded and they are available for you to look at if you missed. If you have questions, go ahead and ask in the chat window and we'll get you all set up. And if we end up having any technical difficulties with this, then it will be recorded and you may look at it afterwards. Okay, let's see here. All right, oh, there I am in Dubuque. I think next year, because I'm growing my hair out again, I'm gonna to have to use another picture. Okay, so let's talk about some things from around Denver and beyond, and sometimes very far beyond. So this is not an exhaustive list. That is a good reminder, actually. This is not an exhaustive list of everything that happened in the 1930s, holy Guacamole, there were a lot of things that happened in the 30s. So these are just some, some things that occurred to me and that I think are important or that I like to talk about. So that's why they're on the presentation tonight. So I hope I'm not missing anything that you really, really like. Okay, so last month we talked about some things you may have already known. We have some more for this month, such as the Depression. The Great Depression, 1929 and on into the 1930s. This is a story you probably already know a lot about. I am not going to go into this a great deal. We'll talk a little bit about Denver, but it's a story you already know, so I'm gonna leave that to the fact that you already know it. The Dust Bowl, we are gonna to touch a little bit on, since that one is not as much a part of the public consciousness. Uh, Bennett, even though Bennett was already out there as a bit of an agrarian community once upon a time east of town, uh, it was incorporated there. Uh, some of the Bennett history items say 1929, some of the Bennett history items say 1930. Um, I'm running with 1930 because that was with the official city stuff, and that's because where the Long Hopes Donkey Rescue is. So that's what I'm going to run with. Also, because I like astronomy and we do our dark skies programs every year, Pluto is discovered, as I said, sometimes really beyond. So I'm going to leave it to you and your family and friends to debate planet, dwarf planet, all that sort of stuff. But at the time, it was a planet, our ninth planet or not, discovered way back in 1930. Some great things came into the parks. At this time, Great Sand Dunes became a national monument in 1932. Over the course of the remainder of the decade, Curricanti and Dinosaur would come in. Often what happens is these become national monuments first, sort of as a stepping stone toward becoming a national monument uh, to start the building and start the uh, improvements of the place. Also to see what the public thinks about it. Some places don't want to have a national park because when you get a national park, you get more visitation and such as customers, uh, excuse me, Custer State Park in South Dakota doesn't want to be a national park because then they'd have too many people. 1934, prohibition is repealed, whether you be a teetotaler or a lush. Uh, at this point, we can all agree prohibition 
probably had some really unintended negative consequences for the United States. It really gave rise to organized crime in a way that we hadn't seen before. And I think that's an unfortunate thing. <clears throat> so prohibition went away. As you know, Colorado went dry in 1916. So that meant for 18 years, no one in Colorado had had a single drink because it would have been against the law. <clears throat> 1936, the Hoover Dam goes into uh, function. And this is one of numerous projects that would go in on the Colorado River. And we are still working with those places today. Uh, you are probably following what's happening in the news with the lowering of the Colorado River and the water behind the Glen Canyon and Hoover Dams. Okay, this is one that I thought about going into more fully, but I decided to leave sort of as a small piece. It's not super Denver specific, but in the Great Depression, we did have a lot of people moving, looking for jobs. And at one point, we had so many folks coming from the South, New Mexico and other points to the South, Texas, et cetera, that Governor Johnson declared martial law closing our southern borders against aliens, that's the word he used, coming in and taking Colorado jobs from Colorado citizens. This, of course, way against the law. He actually called out the National Guard and had folks uh, secure our southern boundaries. This is uh, something he got a lot in trouble. He got in a lot of trouble for that, uh, but it actually did happen for a while. There are some great pictures out there showing Colorado's southern boundaries closed off to those who were not wanted here to take jobs from the ones who are trying to find jobs here. A much bigger story, but since it's not Denver specific, I didn't really choose to focus on it. Uh, again, not too far from us, Will Rogers Shrine of the Sun, 1937. And some of you know that this coming January, I am going to do a tour to the national parks of Southern Florida with an optional Disney add-on. Any of you who've traveled with me know that my heart belongs to the mouse and Snow White, Disney's first full length animated feature began uh, that March into my heart, 1938. And in 1939, September 1st, World War II begins in Europe. And since we're talking about movies, uh, my mother's favorite movie, Gone with the Wind came out in that year and it won best picture the following year, beating out Wizard of the Oz, a uh, Wizard of Oz, excuse me, my in-laws believe that Wizard of Oz was robbed. So those are some exciting things that happened in the 1930s and maybe not so exciting things, but just a few things. All right, let's talk a little bit about the Dust Bowl. So there are lots of pictures out there for you to look at if you would like to examine the photographic record a little bit more. So, the Depression did hit the entire nation, of course, uh, but locally it was complicated by the fact that we were dealing with some environmental disaster, uh, specifically known as the Dust Bowl. I wrote down some numbers here. Okay, in 1930, Baca County, which is how they say it in Baca County, had 237 acres in wheat production. By 1936, that number had dropped to 150. So 237,000 down to 150. Now, while southeastern Colorado did bear the brunt of this environmental disaster, really the entire eastern part of the state, all the way up to Julesburg, did experience some consequences of these horrible uh, agricultural practices that we'd been putting into place. The 20s had been the beginning of the 20s had been really wet, which is why the Colorado River Compact is a bit of a bugaboo for us. But we ended up coming into a giant drought and we lost a lot of topsoil. So this would create clouds that you see here uh, rolling across the landscape. For those of you who've read um, Centennial or seen the miniseries, there are some horrifically graphic scenes of that. Apparently, the story of the woman going nuts and murdering two of her kids and then uh, she and her husband uh, kill themselves is apparently a true story. Okay, I guess I forgot to mention that one good thing did come from prohibitions ending. The Buckhorn Exchange in Denver was able to get liquor license number one. So not only is it Denver's oldest restaurant, 
but it also has liquor license number one. Now in the 1920s, we talked about how we began to divvy up this here river. Well, in the 1930s, uh, we began the process of putting dams on it so that we could control it, retain the water, and then of course, control flooding and have fun with the water sports and all that stuff, boats and swimming and such. However, uh, there would be some folks who did not agree. We have dammed up most of the rivers that feed into the Colorado. So that's why ones like the Green or the Yampa are so precious because they have not really been dammed. So the 1930s, and we're gonna talk more about water in the 1930s, uh, really began to see us changing how we, rea uh, how we lived with our rivers. Okay, this is something we do each one of these presentations. We actually march through the development with these maps. As I say, each time I did not create these maps. These were created by a colleague of mine, Ken Schreppel with Denver Urbanism. He is a real trooper to create all of this. <clears throat> so a reminder, what you see in gray is what had been developed previously in these Denver counties. And what you see in red, of course, is developed during that county. So we do a 30 year spread. So here you have the 1920s. Now watch how things do slow down some and then pick up like gangbusters in the 1940s. So let's go back again, <clears throat> 1920s, a lot of development happening, certainly some in the 30s, but not nearly as much. And the 1940s, holy guacamole, do we go crazy. If you look in the southwestern part of the city, you're going to see the College View. Oh, sorry, I went the wrong way. You're going to see the College View neighborhood really began uh, to expand. It's going to start marching more across Park Hill. And then, of course, you start seeing more development in the post-war suburbs of the southwestern part of the city. Now, of course, no Montbello. No Marston development, southeastern Colorado, that wouldn't come for another couple of years, another couple of decades, really. If you rewatch this video later, you'll be able to cycle through. And Denver Urbanism, again, has all of these available for you to look back uh, through time at your own leisure. Let me know if you want me to send you a copy too. Okay, we're just going to march through talking about some fun things or interesting things that I think uh, you might want to know about. And if you don't, then you can just tune me out. Amelia Earhart, absolutely not from Colorado. 100% not from Colorado. Really no association at all. But she did come through Colorado. And the people in Colorado were out of their minds with uh, excitement for her. Oh, I forgot to mention a couple things. In Denver, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Great Depression. In Denver, we did create the Unemployed Citizens League, which was a self-help organization and with the Works Progress Administration uh, and all of these entities, we did try to put people back to work here in Colorado. Uh, in the state of Colorado, $38 million in aid would pour into the state with another seven coming from local agencies, another seven million coming from local agencies. Just some fun numbers in all of the reading that I was doing. So Amelia Earhart came through as she was traveling across the country. Uh, fun stuff about Amelia Earhart. I really admire her story. I wish we knew what had happened to her. She had not intended to be a pilot, but she basically had a close encounter, not a dangerous one, with a plane at a, a show. And in her own words, that little red plane spoke to me and told me that flying and I were going to have a future together. She would become the first woman to fly across the Atlantic alone, the first person at all to fly between Honolulu and the West Coast. She advocated for women to get into flying. She traveled extensively, wrote many books. These pictures, she passed through Denver multiple times. Uh, crowds turned out in huge numbers, especially the ladies loved her. She was such an inspiration for many women, and apparently she was quite admired. So if you look at the picture there on the left-hand side, all of the women dressed not like Miss Earhart uh, did uh, turn out to give her some flowers. Now, 1937, as she was an attempt, as she was attempting an around-the-world flight, 
Uh, she did disappear in the Pacific. That remains an unsolved disappearance. So she did have a little bit of a connection to Denver. She had those flowers from Denver, but eventually she would disappear. On the right-hand side, there she is with one of the editors of the Denver Post, Harry Tammen. Uh, Mr. Tammen, of course, was going to get out and have a picture with this famous aviatrix. Okay, the question is, is that a helicopter? So I believe it is. Uh, that is, what is it? A uh, One of the experimental crafts that she was flying because she was basically game to try things, not just flying planes, but she was interested in experimenting with other modes of transit. So, uh, and the word was, Oh, it's called an autogiro. Hmm. All right, now that's not a word I had known. I did read about how she was willing to try other uh, things to fly, but I didn't have the word for that. Nice. Okay, thank you. Auto, that almost looks like auto euro, which I know it's not supposed to be. Auto gyro. Uh, but she is there with Harry Tamman on the right. Okay, I'm going to make a note here. I read her history, but I didn't catch the word auto gyro. So I am going to make a note for my own lookup later. Auto Giro. Kevin, look it up. All right. So let's continue. Oh, hold on. I have to let someone in. Admit. Okay. Let us continue. All right. Another thing that came in that is well known in Denver is Poets Row. Now, in Denver, we have lots of neighborhoods. So if you said the Whittier neighborhood or the College View neighborhood, uh, people might know that it's an area, but rarely do we have a spot that is only one area, one street, and everyone would know where it was. Poets Row is one of those. And almost all of the buildings that make up Poets Row were developed in the 1930s. One of them uh, was put in in 1929. The rest came in in the 1930s. So let's look at the ones here. The originals were the Casa La Vista and the Casa Bonita. Uh, the Casa Bonita would later be renamed the Robert Frost. The Casa La Vista was renamed the Louisa May Alcott. Robert Frost at least had, uh, not Robert Frost, I'm sorry, Eugene Field. Eugene Field at least had a connection to Denver and Mark Twain at least did come through Denver. But none of these other people have any real connection to Denver. We were just naming these buildings after folks in the literary world. So if you haven't walked down Poets Row, it's a great view of Art Deco and Art Mo Modern. The Mark Twain that you see there on the right-hand side, that is a fine example of Art Modern architecture. So these buildings, trust me, will make a short trip. I think you have, what, five or six on one side and three on the other but they are very fun to look at if you haven't. So in Poets Row, go have a look. All righty. Oh, okay, where is Poets Row? So Poets Row is on Sherman, north of 11th. Yes, that sounds right. I'm gonna look it up right now. It's funny, I go there all the time, or at least I walk by it all the time. So you'd think I have, would have that memorized. So Sherman Street, north of 11th, and I'm just gonna check here. <laughs> so while I am doing that, the 1930s also claimed two of our grand doms in our state's history, both of which did have, okay, it's, it's Sherman north of 10th. There you go, it's between 10th and 11th, it's closer to 10th. Okay, thank you for your patience with that. Uh, both of these women had a connection to Denver. Uh, one of them a little, little more strongly, I would say. Margaret Tobin on our right-hand side ended up marrying a man, J.J. Brown. He ended up getting to be very, very rich and they moved to Denver where she became very much enamored of the city, sought to be a part of, quote, the beautiful people of Denver and their wonderful lives. And she ended up traveling extensively of course, you know about what happened to her in 1912 with the sinking of the Titanic. Eventually, she and JJ divorced, and she did die in 1932 in New York City. An autopsy revealed that she had a brain tumor 
uh, although I believe she actually died of uh, a heart attack, but she all, she did have a brain tumor. I'm not 100% on the heart attack, but I do know she died in New York. And eventually her house, what is today now the Molly Brown House Museum, would be sold and made into apartments. Uh, another grand dame of Colorado history, Elizabeth McCourt Doe Tabor. You see her there on the lower left-hand side. Most folks uh, would have you uh, call her by baby doe, but I think that's probably inappropriate. Unless you were her husband reincarnated, you probably should not call her by her lovey-dovey name. Her name, Elizabeth. This, of course, the most famous rags to riches to rags story in Colorado history. Elizabeth McCourt Doe Tabor would die frozen to death on the side of the mountain there in Leadville in the Matchless Mine area. Uh, the history books debate exactly why she froze to death, but we don't debate that she did freeze to death. If you haven't uh, looked into the story, there are lots of books out there. Every 10 years or so, the uh, Central City Opera House does the Ballad of Baby Doe. If you haven't gone to watch it, you should. Of course, remember the famous lines, so fleet the works of men back to earth again, ancient and holy things fade like a dream. Okay, so that was from the Tabor Grand Opera House. So in the 1930s, we also got some wonderful buildings, yay. The Paramount Theater that you see there in the upper right-hand side opened in 1930. Wonderful Art Deco architecture there, and the building still retains its original organ. So we have in the past uh, gone in for organ tours in places around Denver. I hope actually one day we will resume doing that because weirdly someone was just talking to me about that yesterday. So we shall see. So. Another building that went in at this time, what had originally been called the uh, Queen Theater was damaged in a fire and would be rebuilt as you see the Mayan Theater as we call it today. Now, when it, re when it opened, excuse me, uh, it was called, pronounced the Mayan. So someone's saying, I thought the Paramount had two organs and maybe one is gone. There may have been two organs. That is entirely possible. I do remember from my tour there that the lady told us that it was the original organ. Uh, she might have said that another one had been there and I just don't remember. So that is one of those details I'm not 100% on. So the, uh, the Mayan, although it was pronounced the Mayan at the time, opened 1930. At the time, they were super interested in exotic. We had the Aladdin, the Oriental, all of these theaters opening and in and about that time. And so the Mayan was just a part of it. My grandmother-in-law never liked it when I called it the Mayan. The Mayan still going strong today. Oh, someone's saying one organ, two consoles. Okay, we are now getting out of my knowledge base. So I'm going to, going to go with what smarter people than I know. So one organ, two consoles. For those of you who have not yet taken a tour of the Mayan, the historian there will give tours. It is 100% worth it. Uh, just budget some time. There's a lot to see. And then we moved architecturally from the more Victorian, ostentatious schools into ones that reflected the architectural styles of the day, especially Art Deco and Art Modern. Bryant Webster is one of a handful of schools in the metropolitan area. They really illustrate that. Believe it or not, we did a few years ago a tour of Bryant Webster. It's got some fun stuff on the inside as well. Go have a drive by this and some of the other schools from the time period, a feast for the architectural eye. Okay, now those of you who've traveled with me a lot know that there are subjects very close to my heart. Of course, the number one subject close to my heart is food. I love to eat. That's why I tell everyone and anyone about the Oatmeal Festival in Lafayette every year. Oh, which street for the theaters? Okay, hold that thought a moment. Do, do, do. Okay, the Paramount is downtown on Glenarm, uh, 16th and Glenarm. The Mayan is at, it's on Broadway between 1st and 2nd. 
And you know, I don't actually remember where Bryant Webster is. I always just go up into that neighborhood and find it. That one might be on Navajo, but I'm not 100% sure on the school, but I do know where the theaters are. So Glen Arm downtown and uh, Broadway. Okay, we continue. Uh, food, I was talking about the oatmeal festival, even though I just had dinner, I'm hungry again. The number three food festival in the state is coming up in October in Golden, the chili cook-off. Next month, by the way, is the uh, ethnic food festival in Globeville. I'm going, of course, it's gonna be delicious. The 1930s were when we started doing something that others thought was a little bit sneaky. So look here. Notice it says the South Platte River Basin. That's the one that flows through town. But it also says the Colorado River Basin. That's the other side of the Continental Divide. So it was at this point that we started drilling to the western slope to get more water over to our side of things. So I have several dates here for you. In 1932, 11 Mile Canyon Dam was built. At that time, the largest reservoir in the city's system, it does feed Denver. The city's next major step still does piss some folks off today. 80% of the state's water is on the Western Slope, but 80% of the population is on our side of the mountains. So there's a disconnect between the two. So in 1935, construction began on the Moffat Tunnel Diversion Project which enlarged and partially lined the pilot bore of the famous tunnel, the Moffat Tunnel, to carry water from the Western Slope to Denver. In 1936, the South Boulder Creek Diversion Dam was completed, Ralston Reservoir 1937, as well as a treatment plant, all of these things going in to bring water from the Western Slope for use in Denver. Denver water collects around 50% of its drinking water from the tributaries of the Colorado River on the other side of the Continental Divide. The rest of it, of course, comes from our own side with the South Platte. Denver water relies on roughly 2% of the water used in the state to provide water for about 25% of our state's population. So you probably have garnered from this that I am a fan of studying our water, where we get our water, and how we manage it. So the 1930s would see Denver reach to the other side of the Continental Divide. Now, we're not doing any more, uh, but one of the tours that we're doing next month is to focus on how Denver is uh, dealing with water. We're doing, as part of that day, a tour of the water recycling plant here in Denver. Another thing, and I apologize for those of you who've already heard me talk about this, for those of you who know, who've been traveling with me for a long time, you know that this is a story I love, the story of the Castlewood Cam Canyon Dam failure, which did happen during this time. East of Castle Rock, they put in a dam on Cherry Creek, and that was the Castlewood Canyon Dam. You see a picture of it there. Uh, the dam was completed in 1890. Surprise, it immediately began to leak, immediately through the dam. Now, I don't build dams, but I was told, yes, that is not supposed to happen. So there were a lot of worries. Is it gonna break? Is it not gonna break? What's going on? And the powers that be kept assuring folks, it will never break. The architect said, and I quote, the Castlewood Canyon Dam will never in the life of any person now living or in generations to come break to an extent that will do any damage either to itself or others from the volume of water impounded. And it will never in all time to the city of Denver. Well, you know about not laughing last and shouldn't say things like this and all that because in August of 1933, kaplooey, there goes the dam. We had had a very wet summer and this thing was full to capacity and one night in the middle of the night, it just went kablooey and sent 1.7 billion gallons of water racing down the slope to the city of Denver and everything in between. Now, upstream of Denver, what you now have is big cities, Parker and Fox Run and Aurora, Centennial and all these places, 
all that, you know, Parker was there, but really not much else was there. So what you generally had along Cherry Creek would have been farms and dairies. So we did have a lot of life lost among the wee beasties, the cattle and horses and all that jazz. The Colorado River, excuse me, the Colorado Boulevard Bridge was the only one to survive between downtown Denver and the Castlewood Canyon Dam. Uh, some sad stories about what happened there with the animals that got swept away and they had to shoot the animals to uh, basically to kill them because they couldn't get them out of the water. Ladies and gentlemen, when you go to Castlewood Canyon State Park, remember, you're not supposed to walk out onto this dam fragment. Now, if no one be watching, well, do what you do. Certain tour guides, I won't name any names, have gone out to the end of the dam, even though, strictly speaking, you're not supposed to. But again, I won't name names. <clears throat> okay, so the Castlewood Canyon Dam failure, 1933, did have a profound effect on downtown Denver. It destroyed almost all of the bridges on Cherry Creek in downtown Denver, everything from what would today be the area over by the Cherry Creek Mall, all the way down to the first train trestle that survived there at Wine Coop. Everything between was destroyed. So the north and the south parts of the city essentially cut apart from each other. And as you see here, uh, the streets were flooded by this uh, all the way over to Union Station. The domed building that you see in that picture, that was the Arapahoe County Courthouse. We're going to be talking about that building in a few minutes. Okay, now when, okay, what year was the flood? That was 1933. Definitely showed us that we needed some bigger dams. The Castlewood Canyon dam failure was the last major flood on Cherry Creek. Uh, within 20 years, we would uh, start putting in efforts to create what is today the Cherry Creek Reservoir and Dam, although it would take a while. And of course, the 1965 flood would lead to Chatfield, which uh, stopped up the South Platte River. So the 1930s, a lot of people associate with some really bad times. And the Depression, all the people put, a, put out of work. The folks up in the mountains, uh, a lot of them lost their jobs. Folks out on the prairie, a lot of them lost their jobs. So Denver and other cities were epicenters of folks being brought in or coming in on their own, I really should say, to try to find a job. And there weren't a lot. Uh, we actually were having issues in towns as well. But with the New Deal and the election of President Roosevelt, number two, uh, we started to put some people to work. We're gonna talk a little bit about two of those efforts now. I wanted to focus for the 1930s on maybe some of the things that were happy in addition to the things that were sad. So. Although I have no artistic ability at all, let's talk about some of the art that was put in as part of the Works Progress Administration. Even artists had families that they needed to feed, so some of them were put to work. The Colorado Springs School of Fine Art produced two artists that would do murals in post offices in Denver and Inglewood. Post offices being government facilities, uh, were places where we could put in art. This particular work was done by a uh, lady, uh, Miss McGoffin, Ethel McGoffin. Uh, she was from Colorado Springs. At this time, we were very much interested in sort of this nostalgia, the good old days. So here we're showing sort of this scene, this iconic Western scene that people would have looked up to and been very happy to see. A colleague of Miss McGoffin was Boardman Robinson, and he did this scene from an auction down in the Inglewood Post Office in the Inglewood downtown, right there on Broadway. So we were in the process of decking, decorating many of our government buildings, not just in Colorado, but of course around the country. And this would have put those artists to work so that they could feed their families as well. So if you haven't been into these post offices to have a look, do please go and enjoy the art. Just remember to look up. 
All righty. Where is it? There it is. Okay. Okay. I recently did a train tour, and a colleague of mine was talking about many of the trains that have come through town and their various bits of history. And so this is one that he was talking about. And I said, well, there you go. That's in the 1930s. I should add that in there. Now, Denver has been connected by train to the wider, well, I should say, well, it still is. I guess I'll say that. Denver has been connected since 1870. So we have never lost our train connection. We are nowhere near as connected as once we were, but the connections are certainly fewer today. Over the years, we would have some grand additions to the, uh, to the offerings here in Denver. So this one, and my colleague helped me uh, to describe what's going on here. This is a photo of the Burlington Pioneer Zephyr and their quote, Dawn to Dusk Club, comprised of those who rode the Pioneer Zephyr on its initial 1934 record-breaking trip from Denver to Chicago. The group was gathered at Chicago's Union Station to mark the first trip of the Denver Zephyr for regular service between the two cities. And I think it's very amusing that they brought that little donkey along there. So traveling in the 1930s, still very much accomplished by train. It was a very elegant way to travel. Of course, you would have had those Harvey houses doing their thing. Although we don't have any Harvey houses in Denver, once upon a time, there would have been several of them in Colorado. So the Dawn to Dusk Club. All right. Now, I did also want to talk about some sad things. We had some wonderful additions to our city with the Paramount, the Mayan, and beautiful schools, uh, the Mullen Building, uh, the must, excuse me, the Mullen Nurses Building, excuse me. But we also had some really tragic losses. At the time, it was judged that the Victorian styles of the past were old, tired. Those were the has-been styles. So we really wanted to, as they say, zhuzh up the landscape and get things looking a little fancier. One of the things we're hoping to put back, actually, is the archway that you see in the upper left-hand corner there. The Welcome Arch went in in 1906. It originally said welcome on both sides, was covered in more than 15,000 light bulbs. Later on, the side for folks leaving uh, were able to see this farewell on the screen, or on the screen, on the uh, arch, Ms. Paw. Now, some of you have already heard me tell this story. Uh, I have given presentations to folks who speak Hebrew, some of them have told me, that is a word. Yes, it is. It's a farewell. Others have told me, that is not a word. And they speak Hebrew and I don't, so I'm going to let greater minds debate it. Ultimately, in the 1930s, that beautiful arch was torn down because it was considered to be a, an impediment to vehicular traffic. Believe it or not, there is a move afoot to try to put back that arch, the city has said that if someone should pay to build it, the city will give the land for free. Denver, once upon a time, was the county seat for Arapahoe County. If you look at the right-hand side, that is the Arapahoe County Courthouse. Now, you may remember we talked about the construction of that building way back in the 1880s. Well, in the 1930s, we would tear it to the ground. 1902, Denver became a city and a county. Littleton would end up claiming the title of Arapahoe County seat. And uh, the mayor here in Denver led for this building, which he considered to be old and no longer fashionable, uh, to be destroyed. So that was in the 1930s. And Denver's city hall was torn down as well. That's the building in the lower middle. The city and county building would become the replacement for both of those buildings. So these are gorgeous structures that we have lost. Union Station, upper left-hand side, still there, even though it doesn't look like that anymore. 
where you see the courthouse on the upper right hand side, that is where Court Place is today in downtown Denver. And the city hall building that you see there in the lower middle picture, that would be where Bell Park and a parking lot are located at the southwest corner or west, depending on how you orient yourself, uh, 14th and Larimer in downtown Denver. All right, there we go. All right, now this is a story that I find very interesting and I like to share, even though these are people that you may not really have heard of at all. It is music, I love music, I play music and sing, so I like anything from the past that tells a story of how we have encouraged music in the metro area, in Denver. All right, so these two ladies uh, were those dynamic engines of the arts that were kind of behind the scenes. Their husbands were out doing big things, making lots of money, and these two women were behind the scenes uh, doing the hard work to get things going. In 1934, the Denver Symphony Orchestra was created. Now, the Denver Symphony Orchestra would later become the Colorado Symphony Orchestra. So it, that is why if you haven't heard of the Denver Symphony Orchestra, you might be a little confused. It would become something else later on in the 1980s. But it started in 1934. Even musicians were having hard times. We had already had the Denver Civic Orchestra. And when the Depression came, Musicians were suffering just as much as everyone else. So the lady on the left, Jean Cranmer, she was married to our uh, head of Parks and Recs in Denver, George Cranmer. We're gonna talk about him more in a moment. And the lady that you see there on the right, Helen Marie Black, they created that organization, Denver Symphony Orchestra, providing really important employment for many of our local musicians, made sure that they had a wage. I really love the story. If you've not looked into her, they talk her about uh, they talk about her sometimes at the uh, oh what is it the Denver Women's Press Club. So she was called quote a wispy, gentle, elegant, thoughtful dreadnought with wonderful manners and an indomitable will. So she basically would refuse to take no for an answer. And for the fullness of her life, she fought to get um, music out there and to employ musicians, to educate musicians. So it was really important work. And for those of you who may have gone to the symphony, these are the folks who were making sure it survived the depression. So they also worked on other things, the Central City Opera House, uh, what is it? Uh, they, they fought to keep some of our downtown buildings still standing. The move to tear things down was already beginning in the 1930s, and these ladies were fighting against it. So let's revisit Jean Cranmer that you see there on the left-hand side. The Cranmer house, where she and her husband lived, is over, is Cranmer Park, named after her and her hubby. Yes, you've anticipated me. Yes, on the eastern side of Cranmer Park is the Cranmer residence, and the reason we named a park after them is because George Cranmer was long at the helm of the park system in Denver and he helped to bring many things into the public uh, consciousness for Denver, for all of us. It was he who in 1929 bought on behalf of the city, of course, Red Rocks to make it into a city mountain park with an amphitheater he, he paid $54,133, which I think is a steal. He also helped to implement the spear vision for the mountain park system. And I was in uh, Red Rocks, in fact, today. The Cranmer House that you see right here played some very uh, instrumental, oh, maybe that's the wrong word when I'm talking about musicians. It played a really powerful role in nurturing the arts in Denver. Jean Cranmer was such a fan of the arts that inside this house, which I, I've never been inside before, but I've read about, inside this house, she had included a performance space with a domed structure over the stage to improve, excuse me, the acoustics. 
Someone's saying there's a ski run named Cramer in Witter Park named after him. I am not surprised. We wouldn't have any of those wonderful things as part of Denver if it weren't for that gentleman. So they name lots of things after him and I am a-okay with that. So many musicians from the 30s through the 60s were actually able to perform in this house right here. Believe it or not, the Cramers actually would house starving artists in here while they got their education. So the 1930s, a great time for the arts in Colorado, even with all of that, with the Great Depression. So eventually the Civilian Conservation Corps would come and make a camp in Morrison. We're gonna to be touring that camp here this autumn. In Morrison, of course, they were coming to visit what you see here on the screen, Red Rocks. Now Red Rocks we know has been used for an amphitheater in its current sense, at least since the beginning, the very first decade of the 1900s. We have uh, records and pictures and such of performances in the 19 aughts and into the 19 teens, but it would not take on its current form until the 1930s. 1936 to 1941, the Civilian Conservation Corps built many of the structures that you see in Red Rocks today. So this flyover, here you see it again, all of these wonderful places that make Red Rocks such a, a great venue. So the Civilian Conservation Corps there back in the 1930s built this wonderful place. So if you haven't been to Red Rocks, go give it a look. Now, of course, there have been some additions. The Modern Visitor Center, completely new, but it is um, from the 1930s that you get most of it. Now, as I was doing my exploration of the 1930s, this is something I came upon that I'm putting in here because it happened, because a lot of people probably consider this significant. I don't ski, so this is really nothing to me, but I know a lot of people do, and it makes a lot of money for uh, Colorado, so I thought I should include this. Uh, skiing, of course, was not something that always happened here. I've read some of the history of skiing. I've been to the ski museum up there in Vail. By the late 1920s, according to the ski histories that I was reading, Berthoud Pass was kind of the place for backcountry skiers. Uh, what they had to do, though, is they had to be driven up to the top on roads that often did not have any winter maintenance. And then they would ski back down and their friends would come and pick them up. And then they, maybe they would trade which one got to drive and the others got to ski. Well, when I was reading the history of the skiing at Berthoud Pass, I learned that in 1937, a donated rope tow began operation at Berthoud Pass, creating Colorado's first public tow assisted alpine uh, ski lift or whatever you'd call that, uh, to get you back up to the hill so that your friends didn't have to drive you. They had help from the Forest Service, and believe it or not, volunteers would go out in the off season to help remove trees and smooth things out so that it would be better skiing in the winter. So apparently, I had not known this since I don't ski, apparently Berthoud Pass is really considered by many skiers to be kind of where it all began. Uh, the May Company, Denver's Ford dealers, I saw ads for them uh, helping to encourage this increase of skiing in the state. Uh, one of the historians from up in Hot Sulphur Springs wrote, I look at the dedication of those early skiers and I'm just amazed at their devotion, all the work that they put into it. They would go help clear trails during their off season. Can you imagine because of your love of skiing, you'd be willing to swing an ax and pull down trees in the middle of the summer. It was all done by hand. The dedication of those early skiers was amazing. So yeah, for those of you who ski, it all kind of got lifted uphill in the 1930s. All right, now this is a building we talked about several presentations ago from the uh, 1880s. The 1930s, things start to go unhappily for the Windsor Hotel. So the Windsor Hotel opened in 1880, was at the time considered to be 
quote, the largest and most complete hotel between Chicago and San Francisco. And during the time when Horace Tabor was divorcing his first wife so he could marry his second wife, Elizabeth stayed in this place. Let's jump forward a little bit. By the 1930s, this place had fallen on hard times. Quote, the Windsor is the only flop house in the world with a marble fireplace in every room. So the Windsor starts to go downhill really fast. Now, even though its demolition would be several decades in the future, I thought I'd go ahead and talk about that uh, fall from grace for the building here. They did try to restore it in the 40s. Uh, by the 50s, it was back to being moribund and they tore it down in 1960. So the 1930s is when our grand diva of hotels from the olden days uh, started to fall into a real state of disrepair. Another thing that started in the 1930s was Lowry, the expansion of this site, which had been a tubercular sanitarium or sanatorium, depending on which one you like better, into this base. All of these pictures are from the Wings Over the Rockies Museum. Where was the Windsor Hotel? The Windsor Hotel was on 8, Hold on, let me think. I can do this. It was on 18th and between Market and Larimer. It's gone now, uh, torn down, but it was right there, right in downtown. So all of these pictures are from the Wings Over the Rockies Museum. They have an extensive collection of their history chronicled through photographs. In 1938, Lowry begins to be uh, developed. As I mentioned, it used to be a tubercular sanitarium or sanatorium, depending on which one you want. Lowry was an airfield from 1937 to 1994. Here in this picture, uh, you see Lowry's original hangars under construction. Those are the four black roofed buildings in the center. You can actually see the sanitarium in the upper left hand corner of the photo. These had been there since the turn of the century. Those buildings would be later used to be the Lowry Field Headquarters and some training facilities. So this picture, and then I like this one too. We're looking in a different direction. We were looking northwest. Now we're looking southeast. Uh, you can see the uh, properties being, uh, they've been finished, excuse me. This is a year later. This is 1938. And you can see how Everything's just beginning to fill in a little bit. And this is my favorite of the three photos. This one was taken in 1939, showing those original hangers on the right-hand side. And the first of the newly built hangers, the bottom left-hand side of the photo. Also, if you look where the four black roofed hangers are, go above that a little bit, about maybe one digit of your thumb there, and you're gonna see these rows of small objects. Those are tents. As we were ramping up for World War II, we saw the writing on the wall, as they say, Lowry ended up having a gigantic tent city. That's how much training was going on at Lowry. Uh, of course, today, Lowry doesn't look like this at all. Hugely built out. If you haven't taken a tour, please do but it all began there in 1937. In 1939, this gentleman here would be elected to the governor's office in Colorado. This is Ralph Carr, 1939. Well, actually I should say he was elected in 1938. He went into office in 1939. He was reelected and served his second term. His second term of course is when he ran into trouble he spoke out against the internment of Japanese Americans in Amachi and the other nine concentration camps. He actually called them concentration camps. Uh, this is a term we're still debating today, but if you go down to the museum in Grenada, they do say that by the definition that we have for them, they really should be concentration camps. We tend to avoid that term, uh, for installations in the United States, but that's really what they are. So in the 1930s, this man who would end up having, end up having a profound effect on the 1940s would be elected. So we're not gonna talk a lot about him today, 
elected 1938, and he would come into office in 1939 for the first of his two terms. The statue that you see there on the right-hand side is at the Ralph Carr Judicial Center, which is now our Supreme Court building. If you have not yet been for a tour, do please go. It is a great tour, and you are going to be paying for it for the rest of your life, so you might as well have the fun of it. Okay, before we do questions, just a quick, a couple of quick announcements. Longmont Love and Save the Date. We have a tour that uh, we are running, but needs a few more people. Our Longmont Discovery Day, October 21st. We're going to to tour a photovoltaic farm, left-hand brewery, and do some general history. Uh, do please come along. You might not think Longmont's that interesting, but there are lots to do there. And a save the date. Ladies and gentlemen, our catalog for next year comes out on November 18th. We have an in-person event there on the Auraria campus at our main headquarters. Our treasure map, as we call it, will come out at our setting the course event. If you don't have a hot date for November 18th from 6 to 8, please do join us. Look at all the fun over the course of the year I've had there. Okay, so at this point, I wanted to leave a little time for questions. There I am after I've done an amazing performance at Red Rocks. I'm saluting the crowd. I was great, I guess. So I wanted to leave some time at the end for questions. So ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, shout out now in the uh, chat box and we'll get you all set. If you don't have questions, of course, have a wonderful evening. I'll see you in September for the 1940s. My goodness, there are some things to talk about in the 1940s. I have a lot to say. In fact, every decade's interesting, but the 1940s, we're gonna have a lot to say. So yes, if any of you don't have questions, I'll say sayonara and I'll wait here for a few moments to see if we do. Uh, thank you again. I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Huzzah, huzzah for that. All right, the numbers are starting to go down as folks head out for dinner or head out for dessert, whatever it might be. All right, I don't see any questions coming in, so I guess I'm going to sign off for the evening. Ladies and gentlemen, have a fine rest of your day. I'll see you again next month, and good night.